Hello again. Sorry for the short radio silence. Uh, we have two more speakers now. Um, let me introduce Emilio. He's an engineer focusing on big data and geospatial problems. He's a co committee on the open source GeoMesser project at Location Tech and enjoys functional and multi-threaded programming. Jim Hughes applies training in mathematics and computer science to build distributed, scalable system capable of supporting data science and machine learning. He's a co-committee of GMS as well and a committee of our location tech projects, uh, JTS and SF Curve, and serves as a mentor to other location tech and Eclipse projects. He serves in the geo, uh, sorry, he serves in the location tech project management committee and steering committee, and through work with lo location tech and OSGEO projects like GeoTools and GeoServer, he works to build an end-to-end -end solutions for big spatial probe, spatial temporal probe problems. Sorry, I clearly need a break. <laughs> um, without further ado, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. And uh, thanks for everyone uh, for coming to our talk. Um, we're going to talk about what we can do with big uh, geodata storage with uh, GeoMesa. So as uh, Kamsen said, uh, I'm Jim Hughes, and I'm uh, I've been working on GeoMesa um, most of uh, for most of its lifetime, uh, and Emilio is uh, going to uh, give the more interesting back half of the talk, where he tells us all about uh, choices between databases and uh, data wakes. Um, first, just to try to define uh, which uh, data we're talking about and what volumes we're talking about, um, we're we're going to talk through that for a second. So, whenever we talk about big data, we actually need to uh, make a definition of that. Uh, at a conference like Phosphor G, we'll talk about uh, at least three different uh, categories of data, three different types of data. One of them uh, that this talk is going to focus on is vector data. There are lots of folks who work on imagery or raster data, and there's a small but growing number of folks um, that are uh, talking through, um, you know, actual point cloud data, and uh, I've gone through them left to right in their sort of uh, weights and sizes on disk. Uh, point uh, and vector data tends to be uh, smaller and more compact. Raster data can take up uh, terabytes of uh, data pretty quickly. And point cloud data um, takes all the space that you could possibly ask for. So if we're interested in. Uh, Jim, I hate to jump in. I think the slides aren't moving. Uh oh. Oh, no. Oh, dear. There we go. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. Great. That's why there's two of us. Um, so uh, yeah, vector data is great. Um, if we talk about what we mean by big, we should talk about some of the uh, data sets that you might think of. Um, there's one called the Global Database of Event Language and Tone. Uh, Texas researchers looked at all the news articles, so pretty much everything that's happened since 1979. They applied machine learning to it, uh, NLP to it, to try to actually put uh, dots on a map for whatever it is that happened. And they have like a 250 million records. So everything that's happened uh, in the world in recent history is not even a, a billion records. It's much smaller than that. A lot of uh, the work we do in open source geospatial uh, especially on the data side, uh, revolves around uh, understanding and processing and enriching OpenStreetMap data. And uh, at one point, whenever I put this slide together, um, you know, the the change set uh, was only so big, and you could get an entire representation of what was in the data set that would fit on a probably pretty expensive, but still on a thumb drive. So um, I don't think of that as big data. Um, one of the easiest ways that I can think of to get to the volumes of data that we're talking about with GeoMesa for perspective is with um, anything that moves through space and time that keeps telling you where it is. So this could be AIS, and that's uh, the signal that's broadcast by all the maritime vessels. There are about 200,000 uh, vessels that all you know, constantly are sending out radio signals to say where they are. Uh, similarly for planes, there's tens of thousands of planes flying at any moment. They also indicate where they are uh, with uh, you know point and uh, you know time and other uh, information about how their flight's going. 
Our cell phone providers have information about where we are. Uh, so ad tech and things like that uh, produce those sorts of records. And as we you know, gather up all that data, it gets to be into the billions of records pretty quickly. And in some cases, uh, I've seen databases with a trillion records in them. And so that's really, whenever I say big data, that's kind of the both the type and the size we're talking about. So uh, to some degree, the problem is how do we handle millions of billions of rows of vector data uh, arriving every day? And this is what GMACE is aiming to help us with. So it is a project of the Eclipse Foundation uh, through the uh, Location Tech Project Management Committee. And uh, it's a suite of tools that help with streaming, persisting, managing, and analyzing spatial temporal data. I'm just going to say real quick uh, what we mean by each of those uh, pillars and what sort of technologies we integrate with to give an idea of uh, what it is GMA says. And then I'll hand it over to Emilio. On the streaming side, we use Kafka for uh, transporting messages. So if we wanted to see where all the maritime vessels in the world were, we would write those to a Kafka topic. And then in GeoServer, we could um, have a representation of um, you know, what's going on with those records. Um, so that's one of the ways we work with streaming. In terms of doing analytics on top of uh, streams of data, we've used Storm for a long time. We're starting to look at things like uh, Kafka Streams and KSQL DB uh, and other technologies there. GMESA got started with big data persistence. That's what the uh, meat of this talk is going to be about. And so we've primarily uh, started with Apache Accumulo, uh, which is very similar to Apache HBase. Both of those are clones of uh, Google's Big Table. Uh, and they were based off of implementing the ideas that uh, show up in the Google Big Table paper from, I think, 2006. There are other things like Cassandra and Redis that we've integrated with. Those are all distributed databases. Uh, well, Redis, maybe not as much. But those are just, uh, you know, these, uh, these are examples of uh, the databases we integrate with. At the same time, we've integrated with some of the big data Apache file formats, uh, like Avro and Arrow and Parquet and Orc. Um, if you wrote out your data in those files instead, you could use cloud native storage like S3 directly or uh, similar things. Azure has uh, blob storage and uh, Google has cloud storage. You know, Every vendor has something they call uh, just having an object store. And this talk is going to be, do you want to go to the trouble of having a database, or would you rather have a data lake? Since we've got data moving around the enterprise, we need something to help us with that ETL. We've integrated with Apache NiFi. Um, I'll be talking tomorrow about uh, GMASA and streaming pretty early in the morning. And that talk will say a little more about what we do with NiFi and also Kafka. In terms of analysis, since we've got data um, either at rest in these um, file formats that are amenable to Spark and Hadoop, we, we integrate with uh, Spark for data analysis. It can also read from HBase to do um, analysis. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Emilio to discuss uh, more of that next part of going, like, how do I choose between do I pick one of these databases or a data lake? Thanks, Jim. Yeah, so just to outline the problem we're talking about, when we're talking about databases, we're talking about NoSQL distributed databases. These are the ones that Jim just highlighted that GeoMesa integrates with. Generally, if you're talking about relational databases, they don't scale to handle that volume and size of data that we're dealing with. So as Jim said, HBase, Cumulo, Cassandra, Redis, Cloud, Bigtable. That's what we mean when we're talking about databases. Uh, next slide. Um, with data lakes, we're talking about semi-structured and structured files hosted in cloud storage. The term data lake is kind of ambiguous and used by different people to mean different things, but this is what we're talking about. Cloud storage, as Jim mentioned again, S3, Azure, Google Cloud Storage, even HDFS on a private cloud, and file formats, Parquet, Orc, JSON, CSV, XML, any of your common file formats like that. So if you're going to choose the database, Let's look at the advantages of why you'd want to do that. The main advantage of using a database is speed. It's going to be very fast to insert and retrieve data. You're also going to be able to update your data very efficiently because these databases have key-based, uh, row-based designs. Uh, 
So you also get data management of your data. So HBase and Cumulo will compact your data, split it up, move it around your cluster for you and make sure that it's all available and for you to query. They also support multiple query indices. They don't have this uh, sensation, or sorry, they don't have the type of column index that you get on a relational database, but in GeoMesa, we create secondary indices and that way you can accelerate some query patterns that you might want to query for, like the MIMZ, which is an identifier for a ship. If you want to query by that, you can create an index on it. And they also provide powerful distributed processing. So this mainly applies to HBase and Accumulo, but with HBase, you get coprocessors, with Accumulo, you get iterators, and GeoMesa has implemented functions to push down all this distributed processing into the database you can do things like generate a heat map, do summary statistics. The benefit is that you do all your processing on the database and you return a much smaller object back to your client. So you're going to speed up your uh, query a lot. Um, you can also do like filtering and transforms relational projections, like selecting a particular column. All these things will speed up your queries because you're not bringing back as much data to your client. So as a detour, we'll talk about the power of space filling curves. Space filling curves are sort of the magic behind GeoMesa. They're the main index structure we use. These NoSQL databases only support a single dimension, basically a sorted key value index, but obviously spatial data has at least two dimensions, often more. So GeoMesa uses space filling curves to bridge that gap. Uh, next slide. So the goal, as stated, index two plus dimensional data in a single dimension. The approach is to use space filling curves. First thing we'll do is grid up our data space into bins. It's an example on the right. Then we take our space filling curve and we use it to trace through all the grids in our space and assign each one with a number. So the space filling curve that we're using in GeoMesa is a Z curve. There are other implementations, but uh, the Z curve has the advantage of being extremely fast to do computations on. And the main thing we're looking for with a curve is data locality and recursive ability. So we want to be able to create the index at a finer grain level or a coarser grain level as we desire. And data locality means that when you have grid cells that are close to each other on the map, they also end up close to each other on the curve. So if you look at the example, there are some gaps in the localities, such as when the biggest one is where you jump from like Greenland all the way down to Antarctica. But generally you can get around this with your query planning and uh, we haven't found it to be a big issue. So space filling curves also have higher dimensions. GeoMesa also has a Z3 curve, which incorporates time. You can get into even higher dimensional curves but because you really need a predicate on each uh, dimension of your curve in order to be able to query it efficiently, if you get into sort of higher dimension curves, you really have to start having very targeted queries that aren't really uh, very general purpose useful. So we've stopped at three, but you could go higher. So back to using a database. The disadvantage of using a database mainly is gonna be cost. They're expensive to run. Compute is always on, even if you're not querying it, it's sitting there doing its thing. They're complex to manage, so anyone can run through the quick start in five minutes. But when you're talking about scaling up these databases, you either need to be an expert, become an expert very quickly, or hire someone to manage it for you. And storage is also expensive when you're talking about these databases because they've mainly been written to work with regular spinny disks. When you write something to the disk, they expect it to be there when they try and read it back. You can mitigate the storage cost by using S3 or blob storage with HBase or Cumulo, but because those are only eventually consistent and not the same consistency that a regular disk has, that again adds to the complexity of managing the database. So then why would you go with a data lake instead? The main advantage, again, is cost. The cloud native storage solutions are very inexpensive. Uh, S3 is one of the cheaper things to store your data on. In addition, 
your data can be represented very compactly, so it doesn't take up very much space. If you use something like Parquet, you get all sorts of special compressions and encodings on your columns that will minimize the size on disk of your data. And you only have to run your compute cluster when you want to. So you can spin up a cluster, you can run a Spark job, you can get your answer, and then you can shut it off and you don't have to pay for it anymore. So because you don't have a whole database, there's less complexity, they're simpler to manage. You don't have to worry about that 3 a.m. phone call that your database went down in the middle of the night. Um, you can also have an extremely high throughput because even though those databases are very efficient, there is some processing bottlenecking that'll go on when you're loading data out of the database compared to just loading files out of the blob storage directly using Spark. And you can still run powerful distributed computing jobs on your data using Spark. Uh, GeoMSF provides a bunch of spatial uh, predicates and functions. Some of those are in the example snippet there uh, that let you run spatial functions on your data. So as a quick detour again, we'll look at ETL versus ELT. ETL is the process of extract, transform, and load. And that's generally what you do when you're bringing data into your database. With GeoMesa, that would be ingesting your data into Parquet or Orc files, storing them in cloud native storage. GeoMesa supports using space filling curves to partition your data on disk, which can make your queries faster because you can only look at the files that you're actually interested in querying. Um, and then the columnar for file formats can be used to prune, transform, and filter your data when you're querying it, which again can accelerate your query time. But GeoMesa also supports ELT, which is extract, load, transform. In that case, the transform part is pushed down to the query time. So it's not as performant because you have to do that extra work. Uh, you also don't get all the benefits of the disk partitioning and the file format pruning. But if you have an existing corpus of data, you can still run jobs against it without any work. The spatial file formats that we're talking about in GeoMesa, mainly Parquet uh, and also ORC, these formats don't have native spatial types in them. So the approach we've taken is to build up geometries using primitive columns. So points are stored as two columns, one for X, one for Y. The reason we chose this is because it lets you do push down filtering against each dimension, which speeds up your queries. Um, more complicated geometries like line strings and polygons are represented as nested lists of points. But because these are all primitive columns, you don't need any special software to operate on these files. You can still read them back using the normal Parquet tools. You won't get all the fancy spatial functions, but you'll still be able to do something with your data. So the disadvantages of using a data lake, mainly data management, uh, can be hard to update records because the record you're looking for is in a Parquet file somewhere on disk, but you don't really know where exactly. Um, it's hard to organize your data if your data is just kind of floating around in S3 don't necessarily know where it is, or it might not be as useful for your users. They might not know where to look for things. Um, it doesn't support different query patterns because your data is on disk. You don't get a secondary index or anything like that. So if you want to look up a record by ID and you don't know anything else about it, you might end up having to read through your entire data set to find it. Um, and similarly, it's not very efficient for small targeted queries because again, we're talking about fairly large files, fairly coarse filtering you're going to have to do a decent amount of processing to pull back those small records. So this begs the question, why not both? Um, this is called a Lambda architecture, where you can have your recent data stored in a database for performant querying. That'll keep the cost down because you have a fixed or semi-fixed amount of data. GeoMesa supports this use case with partition tables so that when your data reaches a certain age, you can just drop the table and it'll go away like instantly. Um, while your historical data you can store in a data lake for efficient analysis using Spark on large jobs. Um, that image in the last slide was a quick picture of NiFi showing how it's fairly easy to do both of these. You can just split your flow. You have two GMAs of processors, one that writes to HBase, one that writes to S3. They're configured almost the same, and you end up with this nice Lambda architecture. Um, so you can take that another step further and go with streaming live data using Apache Kafka, 
In that case, you have your near real-time updates going through Kafka and being displayed almost instantly. You have your more recent hot data in HBase somewhere where you can efficiently query it. And then you have your entire corpus stored in a data lake where you can run MapReduce jobs and Spark jobs on it. And you can access all these things through GeoServer, serve them up to any OGC client um, and make them available to your users. So yeah, that's pretty much it, let's see. So um, Camson has already put some of the questions that have been asked uh, from the platform uh, where we can see them. So the first one is, how do space filling curves compare to quad trees? And um, I'll go ahead and answer that one. I'll, I'll send you the next one, Emilio. But uh, in terms of space filling curves, um, there, it's that's where we like to point out that there are two steps. That gridding space, uh, that gridding step, uh, actually does wind up being a regular quad tree. So whenever you say quad trees, you could mean a lot of different things. You could come up with balanced quad trees and work out uh, lots of details about how they would uh, work out, or you could have unbalanced quad trees where you try to split things up. Uh, but if you came up with regular um, quad trees, you would come up with exactly the same gridding. So if we ever talk about space filling curves having a nesting property, um, that's where um, geohashes would count, and they're really using that z-order curve. Uh, the fact that the geohash uh, ut, uh, u2s would be inside a, a one that says u2 uh, is part of that regular quad tree piece. Uh, so uh, they line up pretty closely uh, to quad trees in terms of the gridding. Uh, the space filling curve part is uh, what order you visit the grids in. So that's how I think of that. Uh, the next question, I'll pass this to you, Emilio. How do you encode geometry internally? Uh, so we, we probably could have talked for 30 minutes just about that, yeah. but. Yeah, uh, so we use different approaches sort of in different places, but mainly we use sort of a modified, uh, well-known binary format. Um, we use Cryo as our encoding library uh, for our internal representation. We also use Avro for more uh, interchangeable format that's more standardized. And that just uses well-known binary to encode them. Um, just going on to the next question, using well-known text instead of um, the issue with well-known text is just that it's fairly uh, verbose in that it takes up a fair amount of space as opposed to just encoding in binary. And also it's harder to filter on and um, push down predicates on because if you just have a double column in your parquet file, you can push down a predicate on that. But if you have a sort of opaque text file or text column, you can't really filter on that using uh, the parquet predicates. Yeah. So, I mean, we do have methods to, you know, expose your geometry as well-known text. Yeah, Th those are good questions. Um, I'll also add on that we have uh, things that will help read in any sort of well-known text to get us the geometry that's being used. And uh, I'll, I'll tack on that we have uh, added support for tiny well-known binary. Uh, that's a really cool format for uh, line strings and uh, more complex geometries, because that can usually increase some compression there. Uh, the next question is, do you store raster data? And uh, we had raster support at one point in GeoMesa. It didn't get as much love and uh, uh, care and feeding as our vector support has gotten. And also, there's another location tech project called GeoTrellis that's really done a knockout job handling raster data. So at this point, I'd recommend checking GeoTrellis out uh, rather than uh, the GeoMesa implementation, which is a few versions old and has been deprecated and removed. Um, so are there other questions? Cool. Um, as the slide says, CCRI is hiring. So uh, we've also got above that, we've got uh, ways to get in touch with us. Uh, we're really active in Gitter. So if you hop on there with your GitHub ID or uh, a few other things like matrix.org, I think, however that works, uh, you can go um, ask us questions uh, if you come up with them later. The next one is, what is the most uh, maintained big table in GMASA? Is HBase still the most used one? Uh, 
Um, hmm. Okay. Um, between HBase and Accumulo, uh, we've used Accumulo consistently since we added that implementation in 2013. Uh, HBase, we're using for most of our commercial customers. Um, and um, both of those are very well used. Uh, there's actually uh, support for Cassandra and um, Google's Cloud Bigtable that aren't as heavily used. So I'd encourage people to consider HBase or Accumulo depending on their uh, needs there. Um, so since we've got some other questions, I'll move on. Uh, what index are you using to index the space filling curve? That's where we're using uh, the Morton order, order curve, Z order curve, uh, to index the uh, grids. Another way to think of it, if you needed to reinvent the Z order uh, curve on your own, uh, once you have that two-dimensional grid of uh, cells, you have uh, two to the n, um, uh, you know, uh, divisions across each side. If you wrote out what column you were in, you would now have a binary representation of where you are, and you did that for both of them. If you just took those binary representations and interleaved them, that would be your Z order curve. Um, but that's a good one. And uh, I really like uh, space filling curves, so definitely ask me more questions about those. Uh, anytime uh, there's a little project called SF Curve that I run that does exactly what it needs to. Uh, how much effort is it to integrate other databases and formats? Um, Emilio, could you say something about those interfaces there if we wanted to have a new backend? Yeah, so we've done a lot of work over the past few years to sort of pull out all of our core indexing logic. So if it's a similar, I'm actually not that familiar with HalDB, but if it's a similar key structure to the big table format, then it can integrate fairly easily. Um, I'm not going to say it's like no work. You might need to know what you're doing, but, um, yeah, we've made it as seamless as possible. And same thing with file formats. Um, we have a lot of Java service provider loading so that you can actually extend these things on your own if you want to pull in, uh, any custom implementations that you might need. Yeah, so we don't have any present plans to integrate with uh, TileDB. And uh, like Emilio said, I haven't had a chance to, uh, neither of us have had a chance to look at it too much. So there might be some good opportunities there. Uh, but it also, if it has a sufficiently different uh, paradigm, it may take some work to integrate. Um, one of the other things, all of our integrations uh, map up to the GeoTools data store API, and that lets us expose things through GeoServer. So, if TileDB like made sense with how we integrate with GeoTools, it would be really cool to have that GeoMesa integration with TileDB. On the other hand, it may make sense to just go ahead and um, integrate TileDB with a GeoTools data store directly. Um, so are there any other GIS servers that serve Kafka's output as well? Um, that's a good question. At the minute, um, I'm not aware of any. Um, Esri has their own thing called GeoEvent that I'm not that familiar with. Um, I We're kind of doing a very specific thing with Kafka. And I'll be talking more about it uh, just to stump for my uh, talk that's tomorrow morning. I'll be saying more about it then. Uh, the key thing that happens is we use Kafka for transport of the messages, and then we have a little in-memory uh, database that reads those, uh, builds up whatever the current state of the world is that can then answer uh, questions that come into something like GeoServer, uh, like anytime you, anything that has a GeoTools query to it. Um, yeah, all good questions. Uh, thanks.